Uh, <clears throat> my name is Newly Purnell. I'm a reporter with the Wall Street Journal here in Singapore. I cover tech throughout Asia, specifically in Southeast Asia. Uh, Nick, thanks for taking the time to chat. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about what Garena does. You've been described as the largest uh, internet and mobile platform company in Southeast Asia. How do you put that in layman's terms? How do you explain it to somebody who doesn't know any, doesn't have no idea what that means? It's funny you say that. When we first started the company as, as, as a team, the, the goal was to try to become the Tencent of Southeast Asia. And I think as we've evolved and we've, we've learned more about the wonderful markets that are here in ASEAN and, and Taiwan, we've learned that there's actually even more that we can do. Uh, I think if I were to describe Garena today, our aspiration is to be a very ASEAN, authentic, hyper-localized combination, a synthesis of the best of Tencent and the best of Alibaba. And uh, tell us about your products. Um, walk us through how they were developed and, and what the most popular ones are. In, in many ways, the, the Tencent is, is more than just an important business partner for us. We look at them as almost our big brother. We've learned a lot from what they've they taught us over the years. Many in this room know that Tencent began largely around the incredible success of QQ, the free to download, free to use messaging platform on PC in China. And that today has hundreds of millions of users across mainland China and around the world. Uh, we began in a very similar way, but recognizing that there were already lots of competitive messaging products out in Southeast Asia and the world more broadly, we chose to focus on a micro-segment, uh, high-performance, prosumer gamers uh, on the PC environment, and the company launched a product called Garena Plus in 2009 and 2010. Garena Plus, which many in this room I'm sure have used, is effectively a, 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 again, a hyper-localized, language-localized equivalent to a QQ or an MSN Messenger, but customized and geared towards the needs of network play gamers. And around the same time, MMO games were starting to really come into their own here in Southeast Asia, and in particular, MOBA games, games like Dota, Dota 2, League of Legends, Heroes of New Earth, became incredibly successful in the region. So once we had Garena Plus in the field, and today we have over 100 million users of Garena Plus across Southeast Asia and the world more broadly, it was an easy next step to begin adding more value to the users by adding games into the platform. So much like a QQ in China with this a QQ games portal, we launched a games portal, a games capability within Garena Plus, and some of the first games we were very fortunate turned out quite well, uh, including League of Legends. And, and how does the online platform differ from others that are out there? How is it unique to Southeast Asia? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, in Southeast Asia, when we first started the business, and I, I say we, I mean that as a collective team, I joined the business at the end of 2014, there were a number of companies producing games locally, not that many, and there were a number of companies publishing games locally. And if you think about the ecosystem of digital entertainment, and particularly gaming, historically there were game developers, and then there were either game distributors in the days of physical CD-ROMs and floppy disks, and then in the world of the internet, game publishers. And their job would be to license content, get some sort of exclusive concession to the game for some period of time, for some part of the world, and then monetize it, typically with subscriptions. A lot changed when free-to-play gaming became a massive phenomenon. And today in China, for example, free-to-play gaming is a $15 billion industry. There's more money spent on free-to-play games in China on PC than there is on chocolate. It's an extraordinary opportunity. The, the difference that Garena pursued, and this was a very important decision, and frankly, internally, uh, a bit of a debate, a bit controversial at first, was not to be a game publisher, not simply to license content, maintain independent websites, independent forums for each game, but instead to be a true game platform. And what that meant for us was launching all the games, monetizing all the games, supporting all the games through the Garena Plus PC client. So if those in the room have, have used Steam, uh, 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 the, the product made by Valve in Seattle, it has some similarities where all of the games are through a single, if you will, app store. And that was the key differentiator to produce a business that wasn't just an amalgam or a collection of individual pieces of IP. It actually was a true platform. And the test of that for us is, when we launch a second game, or a third game, or a fourth game, are many of the users of that new game existing users of the game that we already launched on the platform? And we've been very happy to see that, in fact, more often than not, an existing game player on Garena Plus will try that second game, and will try that third game. Um, Nick, uh, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, a large pension plan, uh, recently invested in your company at um, a reported valuation of $2.5 billion. How does your company make money, and um, why did they invest in you? What, what do they see as uh, uh, attractive about Garena? Sure, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to guess what, why they did that. We, we certainly don't want to be speaking for them uh, publicly. Uh, let, me, let me start with the first question, which is how do we make money? Garena today has four major business lines. We have the, uh, the oldest part of the business, which was founded in 2009, which is Garena Plus, and the ecosystem around that are free-to-play PC games. 
Uh, and added on to that, uh, we've, we've added a second business line, which is mobile games. We have a product called Gas, which is being launched quite quickly, and that's going to be a mobile version of our products. But more importantly, it's going to be an opportunity to really extend some of that capability out to the mobile environment. Uh, thirdly, we have a mobile social network called BTalk, and BTalk is now up to 40 million plus users. Uh, the monthly active users you know, exceed 12, 13 million in any given month. In markets like Thailand, Taiwan, especially in Myanmar, it's done extremely well. And for us, that's less of a monetization angle. It's more just of a great service we can provide to our users, which will build value over time. And then finally, we have a business called AirPay. And AirPay uh, uh, got its start, frankly, as our captive kind of in-house prepaid cards business that supported the game business. But in 2014, we opened up the API for any developer, any e-commerce merchant, even the local ele electricity company or utility to use our network for, for payments. And the critical thing about AirPay, which is so different than any other mobile wallet in the past, is it combines a mobile wallet with an online PC web wallet, if you want to use that. But critically, it has an offline component. So you can go to one of 35,000 physical locations around Southeast Asia, pop money, pop cash into the system, and convert that into a digital currency that the unbanked or the underbanked can use. And we think this is incredibly important. Southeast Asia has 650 million people when you include Taiwan. Only about 15 to 20 percent of them, we think, have credit cards or bank accounts or traditional financial products, the, the 16 digit number you all hold in your pockets right now that you can use for online commerce. That leaves a enormous slice of the population that is underserved or completely unserved. What we needed was a way to let their cash economy that they live and breathe by every day translate into the internet. So we call it, in our internal parlance, a reverse ATM. It's a machine or a booth or a counter where you can put cash in and get digital back out and permit them to, to transact online. So those are the four parts of Garena today. I think OTPP saw two things that came together. One is they saw a company that really had the, the desire and, and, and the willingness to stitch together all of ASEAN. There are wonderful companies in this room today that aspire to do that. We, we were lucky. We happened to be founded in 2009 when this was just getting started, and we were among the first to try to attempt to do this. That's an important part of the platform. And the second thing was they saw an integrated strategy across PC and mobile, entertainment and communication and payments, and a, a sort of a seamless experience where the user could use multiple services under a single login, under a single set of capabilities. And so you're banking on growth in the years to come, I take it based on the fact that there's 600 million people in ASEAN, very young demographics, uh, expanding middle classes. Is that, is that how, what you see as key drivers to growth, increasing mobile access? Um, what, what's on your side in terms of your future growth? I think there's a couple of things. Um, you know, if you sort of multiply a bunch of variables together, that gets you to revenue. It's going to be total population, users in that population using the service, and then ultimately percent that pay, and then ARPAPU, average revenue per paying user. And when you look at those various variables, Southeast Asia, I think, is a wonderful place to be. And everybody in this room, I think, is part of something very special. We have a wonderful population growth rate in Southeast Asia. The Philippines, for example, is among the best in the world, 2% a year. The percent of users that are online are still by no means 80%. In some markets, it's 20 30%. And a lot of those are going to go straight to mobile. And in many cases, not even straight to feature phone. They'll go straight to phablet and have a much more interactive device in their hand with a lot of great capability, both connectivity-wise and, and storage and processor. And then lastly, I think we're starting to finally see a bit of an inflection point in ARPAPU, which is the willingness to pay combined with the actual amount people are willing to pay for entertainment. There are markets in Southeast Asia like Vietnam, which are actually generating more revenue per user than more established markets like Indonesia because of that incredible revolution that's taking place. So for us, it's the combination of growth in users, growth in paying users, and then the myriad of services we can offer them. And, and what are your strongest markets, and where are you most challenged within ASEAN? It's a good question. I mean, honestly, I mean, one of our organizational tenets, one of the, the cultural pillars of the company is humility, so I'd, I, I'd be reluctant to say we're strong anywhere. <laughs> I think we have incredible challengers around the world. I mean, we, we may have a position of strength in any one given market here in Southeast Asia, but we look towards the global majors, the, uh, the Lions, uh, the WhatsApps and Facebook Messengers, uh, uh, the Googles of the world, that the Apples that have incredible global platforms. If you look at mobile, for example, every single person in this room that doesn't work for Google or Apple has to confront the, goal, the, the, the duopoly 
of the Apple uh, iTunes Store and the Google Play Store and what that means for their business and how they can really eke out strategic advantage. Uh, so I think uh, we'd, be, we, we, we'd, be, we'd, be, we'd be overstating the case if we said we were strong anywhere. In terms of where we derive the most part of our revenue, Thailand is an important market for us. Uh, other parts of mainland ASEAN are quite important for us. Uh, Taiwan has been a great market for us. We're headquartered here in Singapore, but only 10% of our people uh, are here in Singapore itself. And talk to me a little bit about the culture. You have about how many? 3,000 employees? Yeah, 3,000 people. That's a lot of people. How do you, how do you transmit? You, you mentioned to me off stage that culture is an important part of the company. How do you make sure everybody's on board and that you're all sort of rowing in the same direction? Yeah, no, it's a terrific question. And look, I mean, there's a lot of happy talk in this world about culture. And, you know, presentations get floated around the internet about what culture means and this and that. And some of those are very good. Some of those, I think, are frankly PR, spin jobs and people. What culture really means is when you have a difficult decision between uh, two tough choices, how you go about adjudicating that. There are companies that we really look up to, like Johnson & Johnson, that have an institutional credo, sort of a constitution of sorts, that d dictates how they make the very tough decisions. And we want to be a company that handles things in a very thoughtful way like that. Uh, culture is what we do every day. Culture is what we do when no one's looking. Culture is the CSR project we do that doesn't get a press release. Culture is the people we hire that may not have the exact right background, but have the potential to really shine. We have a, a young woman working for us in Thailand right now. She's originally Vietnamese. She taught herself Thai in less than a year, and now she manages 400 people for us. Culture is finding people like that and giving them an opportunity to lead really early on in their, in their careers. But ultimately, I think for us, culture is fundamentally putting uh, the sustainability of the business ahead of near-term profits, and culture is putting the, the governance and the ethics and the, the a sense of fairness in terms of how we handle ourselves internally and with our business partners, again, ahead of any sort of shareholder value creation. The result, I think, has been very attractive, but we've done it uh, as a byproduct, not uh, as the ultimate goal. People have mentioned to me in the past that it can be difficult for startups or young companies to hire talented people in the region. They might be attracted to go to Silicon Valley. There might not be educational institutions churning out the kinds yeah. of workers who, can, who have the skills you're looking for. There are cultural challenges. Might, people might not want to take risks. How do you look for the right people to hire? Um, and, and how difficult is that? Is, it, is, it not, is, that, is that overselling the point, or how, how difficult is it to find people who are really, you know, can, can do a world-class job? No, I think you're, you're on exactly the, the, the single most important issue that all of us should walk away from today, you know, focusing on and thinking about. My, my job at Green as president is really ultimately to run the balance sheet, and what that means is very, very importantly, first and foremost, uh, it's, it's the people side of the balance sheet, our, 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 our talent, uh, our professional development processes. It's the brand side of the balance sheet, and then where I end up spending <laughs> probably too much of my time is on the financial side of the balance sheet, capital raising, M&A, investments that we make. But the people side of every company's balance sheet is the single greatest asset that will grow over time. Um, yes, it's true that we don't have a 25 or 30 year history, or in the case of Silicon Valley, a 150 year history of tech-driven innovative businesses here. So yes, there, there aren't pantries to, uh, to, to raid, so to speak. Uh, in established companies here that we can go after. Okay, so be it. But when you look at some of the very best companies out of Silicon Valley, many of the earliest employees had fairly atypical backgrounds. They were young people. Some of them were dropouts out of college. I think the bigger challenge isn't hiring at the youngest levels. It's hiring at the middle management level. I mean, the old saying is very true. People join a company for its promise, its pitch, its brand. They leave because they hated their boss, who was typically a middle member of middle management. So how do we find and train and develop people to be really good general managers? The old art of managing people well, motivating them, inspiring them, coaching them, that I think is the single biggest uh, gap in Southeast Asia. With good middle managers, we can take any talented, thoughtful, high integrity person who comes into the doors of Garena or into the doors of your companies and turn them into very high performing employees. And ultimately, we, we measure ourselves by one important test, which is are, are people gonna look back and say that no matter how old they were or how many years they spent, were these years some of the best years of their life in terms of their professional career? People that worked on the iPad can all say that. People that worked on the iPhone can all say that. We want our people to be able to say that as well. And where do you see Garena then in 10 years, in 15 years? W what is your pitch to promising young people who might want to join the company? Um, yeah. wh what's your vision? L I'll start with maybe the crudest possible metric, which is important to our shareholders, of course, which is the shareholder value of the company. I mean, today, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Garena has been successful in raising capital at valuations that reflect, I think, the growth of the business, the intrinsic value of the business. Uh, let's just look at China as an example. China has about $600 billion of public market cap of internet slash mobile slash technology. It probably has another 200, give or take, of private market cap. So call it $800 billion of value that's been created. 
in a country with 1.2, 1.3 billion people, ASEAN is roughly half the population, probably a third to a quarter of the GDP. But there's no reason why in five or six years we can't have a $200 billion ecosystem here of actual real market value, not you know, sort of flim-flam bubble valuations, but real, real EBITDA, real net income, real cash flow, real business models. So if the goal is to get to $200 billion, I think there will be multiple companies, if you follow a power law, that are at the 20, 40, 60 billion dollar valuation in Southeast Asia that can be very successful. Our goal is to aspire to be to one of those companies. Uh, what does that mean tactically? I think the, the, what I mentioned at the beginning, the synthesis of a Tencent and an Alibaba business model is very relevant to Southeast Asia. And for us, the most important concept is platforms. Uh, Green Plus is not a game publishing business, it's a game platform. AirPay isn't a payment processor, it's a payment platform with real network effects. BTOK isn't just a single one-off messaging client. It, this is not Eudora where you send a one-off email to somebody. This is a actual social network friend-finding platform. And likewise, I think over the next three or four years, you'll start to see us launch more platforms, some of which are currently under development, that are gonna be really compelling to users and ultimately tap into the authenticity of Southeast Asia, uh, so perhaps at this stage next year, we can tell a little bit more about what's in development. In fact, just in the next several weeks, we'll be able to share a bit more of what's happening. What about plans for raising more funding and a potential IPO? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think we've, we've elected to raise capital roughly every nine months. That sort of feels like the right balance between not spending half of our time raising capital, but also making sure that we're able to raise capital as the value of the business itself increases. Uh, so far, we've not had a single shareholder, even from the very earliest days, ask for a complete liquidity event. Uh, some have been sort of shaving off little bits of the, uh, the ice cube uh, as the years go by for liquidity planning, for tax planning, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, I think we'd like to keep on that cadence uh, about every nine months. Uh, a lot of people ask the question about IPO. I mean, I'd, I'd share this maybe, and I'll, I'll sound a little old-fashioned when I say this. I think an IPO should never be the goal. Uh, it should never be an exit point. It should simply be yet another financing event for the company and for those that are involved in, in a sort of very you know, large customer-based businesses, perhaps a branding event and a validating event that helps ease the customer decision, whether it's a consumer business or a B2B business. But it should never be the goal in and of itself. I mean, most companies that pursue the IPO as, as the objective, I think, often find themselves disappointed by <laughs> how, how, how life is post that, post that event. So our goal is to go public at an event and a time when we feel like we're ready. Uh, we feel like the public markets are perhaps a little bit less frothy than they are right now, and where we can have a sustained pattern of value creation for the investors that partner with us in that event. And Nick, in addition to OTPP, who are your investors? Uh, there are two that have been publicly disclosed. Uh, my old firm, General Atlantic, I used to be the CEO of GA Southeast Asia. I founded the GA office here four years ago. and. My investment I made uh, while here for GA was the investment in Garena. That was the Series C round. Uh, and then I joined the company as group president at the end of last year. And then Ontario Teachers uh, came on board at the beginning part of this year. Um, you mentioned BTOC. Uh, it seems like one challenge for you might be distinguishing um, your offerings in a very crowded space. And messaging apps are a very crowded space yeah. in this part of the world. Um, how mindful of that of you are of that challenge, and, and what do you do to to create something that's uniquely Southeast Asian, or do you? No, you're absolutely right, and it's 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 something that's top of mind for us every day. Uh, there is a real fact and reality of first mover advantage when it comes to a highly network effects business like a mobile messenger. So we've deliberately not positioned VTalk as yet another mobile messenger, you know, Y-O, <laughs> Y-A-M-M. Uh, instead, in places like Thailand and Taiwan, where it's done extremely well, it dovetails nicely with, with Line, which has conquered, I think, a pretty significant portion of those markets. It's a m application for broadening your social network. It's an application for finding guys to play, pick up basketball with one afternoon. If you're looking to complete a foursome for golf, if you're looking to find someone to go mountain biking with, if you're looking for somebody who's interested in a certain kind of cooking. So it's a highly interest group based mechanism for broadening group interaction. And we find that it works very well in those markets. In places like Myanmar, we're really proud of what our BTOC team has done. They were effectively first to market in Myanmar, plus or minus. And today, half of all the mobile users in Myanmar are using BTOC. Uh, as really their de facto messaging application, uh, which is terrific. And uh, I think you know, if we can continue to execute very well, as Myanmar starts to get to 80, 90% mobile saturation over the next five to 10 years, they will continue to be using BTOC as the platform of choice, much like a Kakao in Korea or WeChat in China. Uh, Nick, how do your, your, your customers, your users, uh, differ throughout the region? For example, does someone in the Philippines use 
a Garena Plus in a different way than you know someone in you know Myanmar is using BTOC or how how is how is geographically how are your your users uh, using the service differently in, in this part of the world? No, it's a great question, and you know, I remember when I was at General Atlantic bringing Garena to investment committee, I actually put a slide together that looked at the difference in income between the poorest American state and the wealthiest American state. I think it was Mississippi and Massachusetts, and it was about a two and a half to one ratio, give or take. And then I showed them Southeast Asia, the difference between the poorest country here, which would probably be a Timor-Leste or uh, something like that, to the wealthiest country, which would be Singapore, is actually a hundred to one. It's a two to one logarithmic difference. It's an extra, a power of two logarithmic, it's an extraordinary difference in living standards and attitudes. Now you combine that with different consumer tastes, uh, different standards of governments, uh, different forms of government, different economic realities. It's a very polyglot part of the world and there is definitely no such thing as a universal suit size that will work across the region. All that said, and you know, that, that's certainly what you'll hear you know, the pundits say, all that said, we're really proud of the fact that Greena Plus is the same application in every single country. We haven't dumbed it down, we haven't diluted it, it hasn't been changed in any way except for true language localization and then on top of that, hyper-localization of the content. So each of our games, even League of Legends, is a slightly different game in each one of our countries, and it goes much, much beyond uh, the language customization. Uh, the payment mechanisms are dramatically different country by country. Those that have been to Thailand know how important the ATM network is for uh, online transactions, even though it's an offline kiosk. Uh, in Vietnam, there's a tremendous amount of cash-based interaction, as there is in Indonesia and the Philippines. So whether you're a wealthy Singaporean living in Bukatima, or you're a 15-year-old kid living in Surabaya, You'll use the same technology, but the interface points for content and for uh, for payments will be very different. That that brings up another issue, though. Um, if your if your your future growth is predicated on monetizing users in countries that are on the lower end of the income scale, and you're banking on and you mentioned frothiness in in the markets, and a lot of that is predicated on this notion that as companies grow and hundreds of millions of new users come online, they're going to become participants in the internet economy. Right, right. Are you worried, though, that in a place like Indonesia or Myanmar, uh, just because internet penetration is 1% now and it's going to rise to whatever, that doesn't necessarily mean you can monetize that. So is that a challenge for you, and how do you address, um, how do you address that issue? It's a terrific question. Look, th the guys, this is my third bubble. <laughs> I've seen this rodeo before. And uh, I remember business plans I saw in 99 and 2000 where it was, it was the classic top-down fallacy of, well, if I've got X million users and X percent are my, my customers and X percent pay, and they'll probably pay at least $2 each. You know, you, we can go public. And, uh, and this has happened in every technology boom and bust cycle. And the good of this, by the way, I don't, want, I, don't, I don't want to denigrate it, is the good of it is people take risk and they try new things out and entirely new business models and pricing models get created and whole new batches and cohorts of customers get introduced to the internet and to mobile. So this is, this is a uniformly positive, net positive thing. Um, that said, I think when you think about the emerging market context, there's a lot more monetization potential than I think many people give credit for. My favorite example of this is Vietnam versus Indonesia. So Vietnam is 40% uh, of the population of Indonesia. It is less affluent per capita. It's gone through an absolutely horrific 30 to 40 year period of warfare and internal civil warfare and societal transformation. Indonesia never had to go through anything quite as bad as that. Yet little Vietnam today, and I shouldn't call it little, is a larger online game market than all of Indonesia. Now why is that? It's because of a couple of things. Perhaps it's the lack of other entertainment options. Perhaps it's the fact that broadband is unbelievably inexpensive and well penetrated. Perhaps it's the fact that a 3G unlimited data plan costs about $3.50 in Vietnam, whereas it costs a significant multiple of that in, in Indonesia. And perhaps it's a whole bunch of other factors that we still haven't been able to identify. But the point is, even in a less affluent environment, you can create tremendously large economies uh, for the internet. So we would argue that the real pain points are less the GDP per capita. It's more the penetration of broadband. It's the viscosity of payment. How much friction is there in the payment channel? In Vietnam, it's, it's actually a little easier than other parts of Southeast Asia. In China, it's a piece of cake with China Union Pay and direct gyro from bank to, to, to mobile phone app. Um, those are actually the more important, I think, limiting reagents uh, in the chemical reaction. Um, Nick, tell us a bit more about your background, and you're the group president. Tell us a little bit about the founder and uh, how Garena came to be. When was it started, and um, uh, who are the, the key people involved? Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll be brief on my background. Uh, I, uh, I'm an American originally, uh, but uh, as I say in America, ABCD, American born, confused they see. 
uh, child of, of South Asian immigrants to the U.S. many years ago. Uh, I came to, I've been with General Atlantic uh, from 2002, was with General Atlantic from 2002 to 2014, uh, and was with McKinsey and Company before that, joined Garena uh, first as an investor and then as the group president at the end of last year. Uh, uh, I think much more exciting in terms of their life stories are our co-founders. Forrest Lee was a year ahead of me in business school at Stanford and uh, has an extraordinary life story. He grew up uh, in a middle class family in Tianjin in China, worked at Motorola for a little bit, got, got, uh, got admission to Stanford, came over to the US, and his eyes opened on the potential of technology and entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley. Came to Singapore to follow his wife, who was a Tomasic scholar. Uh, his father-in-law famously told him that if he wanted to marry his daughter but not live in Singapore, it was no deal. <laughs> he had to come move here. Uh, and after uh, working at MTV for a year, began his entrepreneurial journey. Uh, founded Green in 2009 and uh, has really been the heart and soul uh, culture of the company for a very long time. His business partner and co-founder, Yegang, uh, was uh, also, like Forrest's wife, a Singapore scholar. Uh, came from China, worked at the EDB for a number of years, and then started the company with Forrest. And then likewise, David was a Singapore scholar, David Chen. Uh, so the combination of these individuals plus uh, uh, Bing, who's a business partner of the firm in Vietnam, really helped to solidify the anchor team. And one thing we've been very proud about is the, the company has been strengthened over the years by a tremendous number of Singapore scholars. And those in the room will, will know this is a wonderful program by the Singapore government to bring some of the best and brightest from Asia to Singapore for secondary and then higher education. Uh, they often spend a couple of years working in various ministries or SOEs, but eventually end up in the private sector. And we've been the very grateful recipient and beneficiary of many of these quite, quite talented people. And um, you've been here four years. What's your, what are your thoughts on how the um, startup scene and investment in tech uh, on the part of the government and others, um, how has that changed in the last four years since you've been here? Well, I, th I think we, we can truly say that we now have a startup scene in Singapore. I mean, testament to the incredible people in this room. Uh, there's, a, there's, a real, uh, 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 th there, there's a real groundswell, I think, of energy, of interest. And it's more than just capital flowing in. I think it's very good people flowing in. Great people combined with great business models will always create value over long periods of time, irrespective of the amount of venture capital or, or, or froth in, in the system. So I think we truly now have a great ecosystem. It is still largely Singapore-centric. Uh, I think we can do a lot better in other parts of the region. There, there ought to be more venture capital firms in Thailand. There ought to be more in the Philippines, which I think are still a little bit uh, under-penetrated. Uh, I think Indonesia is doing quite well, but it's still too Jakarta-centric in my view. I think there ought to be great venture firms focusing with offices in Medan and Surabaya uh, and other parts uh, of uh, Balikpapan and other parts of the country. But in general, I think we have a terrific environment. The, the, the test for all of us is you know for Game of, Friends, uh, Game of Thrones fans out there, winter is coming, and what do we do when winter comes? Uh, I do believe that at some point there will be a correction in the equity markets, not necessarily a nuclear winter for technology and startups, but I think it will be harder uh, for smaller companies, particularly at the seed stage, to raise capital. How we handle that, how we manage through those very choppy waters to come, I think will be an important character building and, uh, and, and, and really definitive moment for us as an industry. And I think, you know, if there's one thing that I'd share with the group in this, in this room, I think this is not just the time to build your businesses, but this is the time to husband capital and to make sure that you have enough seed corn to last the winter when it does eventually come and to really focus on building great businesses with a real gross margin, with real cash flow over time so that ultimately you have not just sustainability from a CSR standpoint, but sustainability from a cash flow standpoint as well. The combination of those two can be a great business. And you, to mention the, to continue the Game of Thrones metaphor, if winter is coming, uh, are there sectors, are there companies that you think are likely to get beheaded or otherwise meet a, a nasty end? I mean, wh who do you think is most vulnerable? I think tr trying to predict who Ned Stark is is a dangerous profession, so I'll, <laughs> I'll try to hold off. Uh, no, look, I think, I think all of us need to be very humble. Uh, no matter how big your company, no matter you know, how well uh, entrenched you are from a business model, customer-based standpoint, I think we need, need to be mindful of the fact that you know, we li we're living through a tremendous period of investor support and enthusiasm and, and commitment to our industry. Uh, that doesn't always persist over long periods of time. There will be times when people prefer real estate to what we do in this room, and we'll need to be mindful of that fact. Now, I, I don't want to pick winners and losers, but what I would say is this, though. I think user engagement-based valuations and uh, 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 the traditional sort of eyeball-based valuations that were so popular in 99 with Mary Meeker, I think we all need to be very mindful of the fact that ultimately every business has to produce a gross margin, and every gross margin ultimately needs to turn into cash flow. 
And whether that happens now or in the future is really a very important question for every management team, every board to, to weigh and to debate. And I'm a huge fan of pushing that into the future to gain more advantage today and to build better services for the customers. But ultimately, there has to be a balance in all things. And I think that'll be the real test of which companies survive the next few years. We're almost out of time. What didn't I ask you that you wish I had asked? What more do you want to say? Well, uh, gosh, I, I think just maybe the last thing I would say is um, Southeast Asia is by no means as affluent and as socially liberal and as uh, well endowed uh, educationally uh, a region as other parts of the world. I really think that all of us in this room, and you know, we feel this very strongly at Garena, have an obligation to use the technology we are building, and particularly the platforms that we are building, uh, as infrastructure for the nonprofit sector. So we think a lot about how can we have NGOs ride on our rails, whether it be the BTOC social network, whether it be our payments network, uh, whether it be our e-commerce network. And CSR and social responsibility come in lots of flavors. It begins with just good, honest you know, bookkeeping. <laughs> <laughs> and honest dealing with your business partners, and it can elevate to many other things you can do at different levels of abstraction. But I would just encourage all of us in this room to think, in addition to the for-profit agenda we each have, what have we built, what have we created, what can we do f on Saturday and Sunday in our busy weeks to let the nonprofit sector, to let the educational sector, other parts of the community use the infrastructure we're building for self-interested but, but ultimately profitable purposes to really make Southeast Asia a better region. And we, we think a lot about this stuff and we would welcome and really just, just be, and we would drop everything if you, know, you were to email us and say, hey, we have an idea for how we can collaborate with Karina to do something really good for the Philippines when there's a, the next tsunami or the next hurricane. Or how we can really do something amazing for Vietnam SMEs using our payments platform for microfinance. These are things that we'd love to be doing more of and ultimately we don't want to be limited by our own internal ideas. So please you know, don't hesitate to shout, email, uh, knock on our door, let us know if we can be good partners to you because we want to make sure that this incredible railroad that's been built uh, doesn't just run cargo trains, it's also running relief trains and educational trains as well. Great. Nick Nash, Group President, Greena, thanks so much.